Welcome to Worship Today, Church. My name is Pastor Corla, and I'm very pleased to be here with you as we gather around the table, as we gather around the word that feeds us and the meal that feeds us as people of God in this place. You are welcome in this congregation. You are welcome as we share worship together. And I am so glad to be in this congregation, worshiping and serving alongside you in this place. Particularly this week, we are in the season of Easter. Last Sunday was Easter Sunday. We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrated the victory over the power of sin and the power of death, right? The power that says that anyone can hold God in the grave. We celebrated that and we continue to celebrate that. We're in now the season of Easter and we have a new worship series as a result. We're calling it Common Life. And we're going to take a sort of a journey through the book of Acts, which tells the story of the early church. It tells it in ways that are sometimes very exciting, sometimes show us the nitty gritty realities of what it means to be community together, people trying to serve faithfully side by side when things are exciting and fantastic and you're banking a lot of wins and when things are really hard because community is beautiful and rich and nourishing and hard. And so we get to walk that journey together as a church over the next several weeks. Those That is where the readings that our preachers draw from will come from the book of Acts and that telling of the story of the early church building a common life together that is oriented around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of the things that that life, death, and resurrection of Jesus means for us is that God abides with us and that we know deep in ourselves that we can believe and confess that God always forgives, that God is always present with us, that God's mercy is always enough. And so when we gather in our worship services around confession and forgiveness, which we'll do in a minute, we do that knowing and trusting that there is nothing that we do to earn God's love and that there is nothing we can do to lose God's love. 
That is not, that's just simply not how God's work, love works. And because of that, we go to God in confession, knowing that we will be forgiven and knowing that there is value in doing the confessing anyway. And we also are able to say boldly at the beginning of every one of our worship services, because of that very same trust, that we welcome all people, you no matter where you are in your journey of faith, you are welcome in this place with open hearts, open minds, and an open table. All of that is possible because of this gift of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I would invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. The words will be on your screen so that you can join your voice with the voices of your whole congregation as we pray together. Oh God, you are always doing a new thing. We confess that we sometimes close windows against the fresh air of new ideas, against the noise of other people's worries, against the winds of change. God of every place and time, we confess that we often draw the curtains against people who are different, against world news or community concerns. Forgive us, O oh God, forgive us our insulation in our locked homes, our shuttered churches, our closed windows. Forgive us the security systems we place on our hearts. Open up our lives and let your spirit blow through them. In the name of your child, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I would invite you now to take a moment of silence to add any particular pieces that you would like to add to this prayer of confession before we gather together and hear the good news. People of God, hear the good news. That there is only one who can judge us that there is only one to whom we bring this confession. There is only one, and that one came to earth in a form like ours, a body like ours. That one went to the cross and to the grave for us and for you. That one went to hell and defied death and rose again for you and for me. And that one, that very God, loves you so much. That one, that very God, forgives all things that you bring to God. So people of God, be delighted, be assured that in Christ your sins are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh. Uh -huh. 
The reading today is from the fourth chapter of the book Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The lesson for this day. Grace and peace to each one of you this day. This is Pastor Dan. It's the first Sunday after Easter. I hope you had a wonderful Easter celebration and uh, celebrated the new life that you have experienced in Jesus Christ. And I hope that this year is a resurrection year in every possible sense of the word. So, With that in mind, I want to start with a prayer, and then we'll get on with today's message. So let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your presence here again today to grow us into your likeness, in our own particularity, in our uniqueness, and each in our own beautiful way, to show forth your love and your purpose in this world as we glorify you and love and serve our neighbors. Guide us now in our words and our thoughts. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture that we have in front of us today is this beautiful description of first century Christianity. And it's a description of sharing, of mutuality, of generosity, of abundance, of lack of fear. It is an amazing testimony to the community that Jesus had created through the work of the Holy Spirit in these first century Christians. In this series called The Common Life, We'll be reaching back to that ancient form of Christianity and connecting it with our particular experience of being people in Christ here in this time and in this place. So the context of our life today is overwhelmingly the context of pandemic. And I want you to think here at the beginning of this message, just what are the stories that you will remember that we have already begun to tell about the pandemic There are the stories of grief and loss, which count now in the hundreds of thousands. There will always be stories of what we did right, what we did wrong, how we could have mitigated this loss, how awful it was. And there will certainly be stories of what we've learned and need to reapply in the future, because this won't be humanity's last pandemic. But aside from those stories of of grief and learning, I want to think about the stories of hope and promise that we remember. There was a story of a coffee shop in Stillwater, Minnesota. I know the owners of this, a young couple, a scrappy little couple that owned this tiny little coffee shop. And someone came in on one of the very first days of the lockdown and paid it forward and gave $100 just so other people could experience coffee for free. That pay it forward has lasted now almost exactly a year, every day. From all corners of this country, people have called in, sent in, brought in their money to pay it forward. There were the heroic stories of the of the first responders, our hospitalists, our, our, our nurses, our doctors, who laid it all out to help. We saw stories that would warm our heart of window visits and compassionate neighborliness, right? Where people noticed each other's needs and responded to it. Children that would paint rocks and put them in public places just to give encouragement to people. The drive-by birthday and graduation celebrations, the amount of of support poured out to local restaurants and bars and other hospitality places that suffered so greatly during this pandemic. Story after story after story of joy, of hope, of compassion, of neighborliness, those are the stories we are going to remember. And they're always the stories that humans remember in times of difficulty. Stories of compassion, selflessness, generosity, neighborliness, giving, 
And more fundamentally than anything else, just noticing the needs of our neighbors and claiming those neighbors in relationship, that their need mattered, even when we're strangers. And the results universally of these kind of stories is reconciliation, unity, hope, endurance, joy. You see, this is not just a biblical set of truths. It's just truth about the way God has wired us in this world. We need to show compassion, generosity. We need to share. We need to find connection with each other when we are in need. And this series called Common Life, which really does attempt to connect first century Christianity and the truths that scripture tells us that they have learned living in the way of Jesus and our life, our daily life. So several things here. That these are stories of ordinary days. As ordinary people live out this way of Jesus, these are not heroic stories. You and I can oftentimes put ourselves on the sidelines in our Christian faith by saying, really, the, the things that are important are, are, are meant for people more than me, bigger than me, more spiritual than me, more churched than I am. It's not the point. The point of these stories is that it's ordinary people like you and me in our ordinary lives, in our ordinary ways, living out the way of Jesus. And in our baptisms, we are first told that that is within our capacity. It's within our reach. That in our own skin, and our own ordinary lives, we can be Jesus for this world. So, the things that support that idea is, first of all, that the roots of our life need to be firmly embedded in gratitude, joy, and a knowledge of abundance. You read this story from the first century Christians. They were rooted in a sense of abundance that they together had enough, even if any of them individually at any moment in time did not have enough. That they saw a mutuality and a connection, a community that implied unity. And that out of this sense of abundance and a sense of gratitude for what Jesus Christ had done for them, a deep and abiding gratitude, there was also this joyfulness. <laughs> that it wasn't scary to give. It wasn't scary to share. It wasn't scary to care for your neighbor. It wasn't scary to let go of things you might have thought were your possessions. The roots of our life now need to be rooted in exactly the same soil. Gratitude, joy, abundance. Secondly, this story tells us a lot about stewardship. It's an old-fashioned church word, but it sure applies here, and it applies to your life and mine, too, that the things we think we own, A, can never own us, and B, are just ours for a brief period of time, to steward. And to steward to what end? To make ourselves richer? No. We steward the resources that we have been given custodianship of, for the sake of glorifying God, we're loving and serving our neighbor. That's it. That finally the point of it all isn't the bigger office, the bigger car, the bigger house, the bigger paycheck. The point of it all, finally, is to be of use in this world. <laughs> to join God in God's crazy project of making sure everyone has enough. And we in our consumer culture oftentimes thinks that, that it's the size and number of our possessions that define who we are, and that is so broken and so lost and so far from the life in the way of Jesus. And in the end, it turns out in this bizarre way, our possessions possess us. When we hold on too tightly to the things that we have been given stewardship of, they eventually own us. And our span of care narrows down to a very small path of selfishness. The roots of our lives need to be in gratitude, joy, and abundance. And secondly, we need to carry forward a healthy knowledge and awareness of stewardship. The third point here is that compassion is seeing the needs of others. Compassion isn't just an act of giving. Compassion is first and primarily an act of seeing. That we see in our neighbor 
equality, that person and, 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 and myself are both beloved children of God. And we also see that we are, our well-being is intrinsically wedded to the well-being of our neighbor. And if they are not well or whole, neither are we. So compassion is primarily an act of seeing. And that is what is so tragic about our current moment in time when we are being pitted one against another. When things like racism are rearing their ugly heads, we realize how far away we are as a culture from being able to see with eyes of compassion, of commonality, of mutuality. When we fail to see the beauty in our neighbor, we cannot be truly compassionate. Fourth point here is that that, that this is about mutuality and vulnerability as well. That we are at the same time both giver and receiver. That we are not the ones who are completely whole. We are not the ones that have everything that you could possibly have. Instead, we also need to be real about our needs, our brokenness. And we need to be willing to receive the gifts of others as they give to us so that we might be whole. There's a fundamental need for each of us to be needful, to realize we have more to grow. We have more to experience. We have more to know in this life than what we have. So we are not just in the position of being givers. We are also needful to be receivers. There is a mutuality in this way of Jesus and living in community with Jesus. And then finally, to end this, this message today, I'll just at, leave you with, with two thoughts. One, the thought of what is your net worth? How bizarre of a concept that we have reduced that to an economic question that can be answered by looking at your bank balance or your 401k balance or whatever it is that you keep score with. What if our net worth was all about how do we use the things we've been given in order to glorify God and love our neighbor? What would change in your life if that was your definition of net worth? Along with that, my guess is that many of you make budgets, your mortgage, your car payments, your savings, your retirement. What if you made a generosity budget? What if every year you thought to yourself, how can we give away more of the things we've been given? How can we loosen our grip on our possessions so that they don't possess us? How can we reach for greater health in our life by living with less and making sure our neighbors have more? Two practical things. Make a giveaway budget every year and grow your capacity every year. And here's the last thought. What if our deepest need as human beings was to give and receive help from one another? What if we can't unlock the, the full dimension of our humanity until we have truly given and been able to receive? I think that's the hidden secret in the gospel of Jesus. You see, there is one sense where each of us needs to hear the Easter message that Jesus was given for you, for me, for me. And then, right as we think of that, we also need to say, Jesus came for everyone. That everyone is a beloved child of God. Everyone deserves to have an abundant life that God designed for them. Then we need to join ourselves with Jesus' purpose in this world to make sure that that happens. What if... There is more to experience in this human life the more we give. That's the hidden secret in the way of Jesus, is that in the giving, we receive our fullest humanity, the fullest measure of joy, the fullest measure of meaning and purpose. There are so many people who are struggling in their 20s, in their 40s, in their midlife, in their retirement, seeking meaning. And I think the answer always is, give yourself away. Find new and more creative ways to give yourself away. In this common life, in your everyday life, just the way you are. May you be inspired by this story from first century uh, Christians 
who were living in the way of Jesus, filled with abundance and joy and generosity, with the ability to see the needs of one another. May it be true in your life and my life this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please join your hearts, your minds, your bodies, your souls with your church community and with the whole body of Christ, universal across time and space as we pray for God's church, for the world, for all of creation in every kind of joy and in every kind of need. I'm going to read these prayers. This prayer is a poem. And between each line of the poem, we're going to leave some time. And in that time, you are invited wherever you are joining us for worship to either silently or aloud, however you're comfortable, to add prayers, to add names of people or situations that you know that kind of fall under the umbrella of what we have just named in that particular line of the prayer. We'll have a space of silence for each of those, and then I will pray the next line as we pray together. Christ is risen. Let us pray for those who do not share our Easter joy. We pray for those who live in the shadow of darkness or despair. For those who live with the hopelessness of shattered dreams, trust betrayed, opportunities lost, love denied. For those who live without faith or hope or love, For those who see no resurrection, no hope of new beginnings for themselves or for the world. For those whose hope is just fledgling and not yet ready to take wing. For those for whom hope feels too risky or too frightening to even consider. If Christ be truly risen, let us show forth his resurrection so that all who meet us will know that he is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Church Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia, and we celebrate, we proclaim that. And one of the ways that we proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is by gathering around this table, where we remember that in the night of his arrest, our Lord took bread, that he blessed it and he broke it, that he gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we remember that after supper, he took the cup, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of all people. Do this as often as you drink it and you remember me. Living in trust and hope, we pray as Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Church, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. You are welcome at this table. God has invited you. I would invite you as you share in this communion meal, this feast that God has set for us and has invited you to and prepared your place for, I would invite you to, if you're worshiping um, in your home with other folks who are also worshiping with you, you can serve each other and you can use the words, this is the body of Christ given for you and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you're like me and you worship on your own in your home on Sundays, hear these words and know that they are true that this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Church, taste and see and know that God is good. Thank you for worshiping together today as Shepherd of the Lake Lutheran Church. Wherever you might be in this world, it is so good to have you as part of this community. Your contributions, your presence, your, your simple act of showing up today means the world to me. And thank you also um, to continue to give generously to this mission as we live out our mission of open hearts, open minds, and open table here in Scott County. We are a unique place, I believe. We are a unique Christian voice in this community, and it takes all of us to make that voice amplified and heard and shared. And also remember your typical yearly Easter giving, because we weren't able to worship in person this year. That opportunity may have gone by you, and so take a moment this week and give an extra gift this year in thanksgiving for the Easter good news that you have received in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, um, we are looking forward to the diminishing numbers of COVID cases here in Scott County uh, so that we can resume in-person worship soon. In the meantime, wear your masks 
be conservative and careful. If you travel, make sure to quarantine. And most of all, most importantly, get vaccinated when you have the opportunity and help others find their places in the line so that we all might resume a more normal life as quickly as possible. That is an act of love for yourself and for your neighbor. Get vaccinated. And then lastly, as a benediction today, I want to read a benediction from an author named Shannon Martin. Please receive this benediction for ordinary days, for a common life. May you go out into this world warmed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. May you see in your walking shoes, in your soup spoons, in your minivans, in your wrinkled hands, the tools for Jesus' work in this world. May you crave low places, the messy, the boring, the overlooked, the complicated. May you grow comfortable with grit in your teeth. May you see God's presence in the moon, God's glory in the clouds, and God's goodness in the faces around you. And may you find shelter in the untamable garden of community, God's kingdom on earth right where you are planted. Grace and peace be with you all this day. Amen. Go in peace, everybody. Love and serve the Lord. Amen. Have a great week. Stop.